Well, at all of our crossing locations, how are you doing today? Are you doing okay? I'm so thankful for you. Before I even jump into the message, I just gotta let you know, I love you so much. I'm so thankful that we get to gather together, spend time with one another and grow. And you guys have been such a huge part of my faith journey and I'm hopeful that today I will have the opportunity to play a part in yours. If 2020 has shown us anything, it is how easily we can misplace our hope. If your uh, security, if your uh, hope was in your financial status, I'm sure that over the last nine months, you've had a couple moments where you had to hold your breath for a little bit. If uh, a part of your family uh, routine and tradition was going on vacations and that was kind of how you put yourself back together, kind of healed wounds from the craziness and you weren't able to travel this year, it probably made a change for you. If you're uh, if you placed a lot of hope and just consistency and stability in your house, I'm guessing you've experienced the opposite of that. It's amazing how quickly we misplace our hope. And if uh, you're the kind of person who places your hope in the political system or the government, I'm guessing after Tuesday, uh, you would say your hope has been dashed a little bit there as well, which is why what we do here matters so much. People who commit themselves to Christ has always been important, but I believe it's never been more important because there's only one place where you can find hope that never disappoints. There's only one place, and that's in Jesus Christ. And that's not important just for the people that are inside these walls. It's important for all the people outside the walls at all of our various locations because they need someone to offer them hope. They need somebody to offer them uh, an anchor in the middle of the storm. And I'm hoping that God will use you to be that person for them. We've been going through this sermon series called The Cure, where we've been walking through each book of the New Testament and kind of uh, preaching an overview of it. And then on Wednesday nights, Jerry and Allison have been doing a midweek Bible study, giving a little bit more insight into it. Well, this week, we are nearing the very end. It's just this sermon, next week's sermon, and then one more after that. You'll want to be here for the next two uh, because they're going to be great. But this one, uh, we combined all the books. We're in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And I want to do is I'm just going to walk you through uh, this message. There's some tough stuff in this message. Heads up. Um, how many of you guys have ever been sick and like the doctor gave you horse pills? Like the pills that are real big? At all of our locations say horse pills that's what today's message is it's a big nasty chalk horse pill okay so uh, first John chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 that which was from the beginning that's Jesus which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked at and our hands have touched this we proclaim concerning the word of life the life appeared we have seen it and testify to it and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the father and has appeared to us he's talking about Jesus here we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ we write this to make our joy complete 1 John, 2 John, 3 John are letters written by a man named John. And he's writing to these believers, and he keeps using throughout this entire, uh, all these three books, the word dear children. It's like he is a father who is sitting his sons down in the living room and saying, we need to have a talk. And he starts going through, this is what the expectations are if you're going to have my last name when you go out in the world this is how you're going to represent yourself some of you may have wondered how is it that we ever came to know what we know about jesus uh, how do we know that what we believe about jesus is the right things to believe about jesus how did this faith that i see so many other people practicing how did it come to be well john tells us right at the very very beginning before he talks about what it looks like to live for Jesus Christ, he talks about his relationship 
with Jesus Christ. He's giving you and me substance to believe on. This is what he's saying. We believe these things because of eyewitness testimony. John is saying, I was there. And when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're gonna read about a disciple that Jesus loved. Well, that's John. When you read about Jesus, you're gonna read about a group of 12 guys that walked with Jesus everywhere he went. One of those 12 guys was John. Inside of that group of 12, Jesus had like a select group of three people that he spent even more time with. Inside of that group, John. When Jesus was at the Last Supper, the last meal he's having here on earth, the disciple that was sitting right next to him was John. And John is saying, I have seen him with my eyes. I have heard him with my ears. I have touched him with my hands. Now he says which we have seen and heard and which we have touched, he's making an unbelievable statement. This is not a pre-crucifixion statement. It's a post-resurrection statement. Pre-crucifixion is this. Jesus was a historical human being. He walked planet Earth. There's no way to dispute that. There was a man named Jesus who lived in Israel, walked around. That true story. And there's all kinds of places that you can get that information. John is not making just a pre-crucifixion statement. What makes Jesus unique, which is why we are gathered here today, is because Jesus did not just live. Jesus died, was buried, and three days later rose again. And John is saying, I've touched a resurrected Jesus, which is what makes, which is what makes Jesus, when he says he's the son of God, that's why you have to kind of go, yeah. Because if you, listen, if you die today, three days later come back to life, whoever you say you are, I'm in too. Right, I'm buying what you're selling. So John's saying, we were there with him, we saw him die, I was there, I watched it happen, and then he, I went to the, I went to the cemetery, I went to where they placed him, and he, he wasn't in there, and then he came to the house where I was staying, and I, I have, touched him this is what it means to believe he's giving you insight saying you can believe because I'm telling you what I saw and then John starts to describe what it looks like to be a Christian sometimes I'll have people send me emails or ask me questions asking me whether or not they're saved or not which just so you know puts pastors in a really uncomfortable situation because we're not and I want to say this correctly we're not God okay we, I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know, there's no win there, right? How do I? So what John does is he actually takes you through a rubric and he just says, this is the stuff that Christians do. This is how Christians behave. And he gives you the opportunity to determine for yourself, where are you at? So he puts his quill to parchment and he starts writing what it means to be a Christian, what it looks like to be a Christian. Uh, let me put it in a different way. Um, most of you guys, you're, you're Midwest people. Have you ever uh, noticed that you can spot another person from the Midwest pretty easily? Like even when you're on vacation in another part of the world and you overhear another couple talking, you can tell that they're probably from the Midwest. Let me see if you guys resonate with any of these. Uh, you're, you might be from the Midwest if you can smell a storm before it happens, right? You walk outside, it's probably gonna rain about 3 p.m., right? You just, it's just how, yeah, it's how. Uh, you, you might be from the Midwest if you dress in layers, like you got your regular shirt on, then your button-down shirt, then you got like a, a vest, just because there's a high probability that you're gonna experience all four seasons in under one hour, right? You've been there. Uh, you know you're from the Midwest. If it's less than a 16-hour drive, no needs to fly, right? Just gas up the car, honey. We're just going to drive through the night. Yeah. I, I, listen, I went to Disney World at least 13 times with my family when my dad was paying for it. Not once did we fly. Never. We just loaded up all the kids in the van early in the morning. I think they gave us too much Dimetap, and we woke up somewhere outside Tallahassee. Okay, it was kind of like, okay, I guess we're here, Dad. Yeah, it's just how, there's only two seasons if you live in the Midwest. 
The season where you say, it wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the humidity. And then the other season is, wouldn't be so bad out here if it wasn't for the wind. That's just kind of how we operate. Uh, you've been in a traffic jam at a four-way stop because everybody keeps waving the other person through, right? <laughs> Carol, go. Come on, Carol. And then, have you ever done this? You wave them all through and then you're like, go ahead. You wave another batch through. Oh yeah, I get it, we've all had that. You know you're from the Midwest if when you try to tell somebody where you're from, you end up just telling them how far you are from Chicago, right? <laughs> You're like, I'm from Quincy. Where's that at? Eh, well, about five hours from Chicago. Oh, okay. Is that near Nebraska? Yep, right there. We're right next to it. You can tell when you're next to a person who's from the Midwest. And what John is saying is you should be able to tell when you come into contact with somebody who's a Christian. He's going to use three words inside this text. You're going to see it over and over again as I read through these scriptures. I want you to pay attention to these. Light love, and the word if. Light, love, and if. The predominant characteristics of Christians are supposed to be, as John describes it, people of the light and people who love. Everybody has a, a desire to be known for certain things. If I were to ask you, what do you want to be known for? You could probably come up pretty quickly with what you'd want to be known for. But if I were to ask you a tougher question, which is, what are you known for? You couldn't answer that question, but your wife could, and your kids could. Uh, Zappos, I don't know if you guys have ever ordered shoes from Zappos. Do you know that Zappos does not want to be known for selling shoes? Zappos' mission is to deliver happiness. The CEO actually says, I'm not even that fascinated with shoes, but apparently it makes people feel happy, so we sell shoes. And the gap between what you want to be known for and what you are known for is your level of effectiveness. Jesus wants his followers, you and me, to be known as people of the light and people who love. Question, how are we doing? If we were to survey the world right now, would they come up with those two statements about Christians? Would they come up with those two statements about me? Would they come up with those two statements about you? And the gap between what we're supposed to be known for and what we are known for is our level of effectiveness. The smaller the gap, the more effective we are, and the wider the gap, the least effective we are. The first thing that John puts forward is that Christians are supposed to be people of the light. We are supposed to walk in the light. Check out this one, 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-7. through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim, if, if we claim to have fellowship with him, say, I'm a Christian, and walk in the darkness, we lie, and we do not live out the truth. But, big word, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Christians walk in the light. And he draws a distinction between light and darkness. And this is nothing new to you. This is not a new concept to you. There is certain activity that takes place in the daytime, and there's certain activity that takes place at night. If today we were gonna have a church-wide event where we were gonna rob a bank, question, would we do it at 10 a.m. or 10 p.m.? Uh, back when you used to uh, TP people's houses, did you do that at 11 a.m.? Or did you do that at 11 p.m.? There's certain activities that we have reserved for the darkness, and those activities that we reserve for the darkness are usually the activities that we don't want anybody to see us doing. Christians don't operate in darkness. Christians walk in the light where things can be seen and exposed. So why do people walk in the darkness? Well, I'll give you at least three reasons why people walk in the dark. The first reason why people walk in the dark is because they don't know there's a light. 
Some of you, as you've been scrolling through your social media feed, as you've been having conversations with people, you've been so unbelievably upset at the stupidity and the sinfulness of this world. And I get it. But you have to understand that one of the reasons why people live in the darkness is because nobody has ever shown them the light. You've heard me say this before. Lost people act like lost people. Unsaved people act like unsaved people. Do you remember you before you met Jesus? And sometimes our level of frustration towards people that don't know Jesus yet actually keeps us from helping them reach Jesus. You can't reach a group of people that you hate. Second reason people stay in darkness is because they've made some pretty significant mistakes. They step into the light and they realize all the things that they had done wrong and then they hurry back into the darkness. They're worried that if they were to step into the light that they would not be accepted and loved. And so even though they know that there is light, the guilt and the shame that they carry over the sins that they've done in their life keep them from coming into the light and having fellowship with you and me because they're thinking that when they step into the light, they're gonna see us and we're going to see them and we're gonna condemn them and judge them. Because we've done a really, really good job as Christians of letting people know all the things that we're against but at the same time, you know one of the things we haven't done is let the world know all the things that we used to do. Sometimes the people I'm the most frustrated with struggled with the same sins that I did. Some of the people I can't stand the most struggle with the same sins that I do. Is my tone, is your tone, is it drawing people out of the darkness or are they afraid to step into the light with you? And then the third reason that people stay in the darkness is because there's things that they actually like doing that they don't wanna give up yet. And you know what that is, because you all have one. It's the thing that you don't want anybody else to know about because if anybody else knew about it, you're pretty sure that they wouldn't want to be around you. And you kind of like what you're doing and you, you don't want to change it. John's saying Christians, we, we operate in the light. The second thing that Christians do is Christians confess our sins. First John chapter one, verses uh, eight through 10. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Jesus out to be a liar and Jesus' word is not in us. This might be the biggest difference between Christians and non-Christians. The world doesn't see sin as sin. The world doesn't get frustrated at the things that you might get frustrated about because, well, the world celebrates sin. It makes TV shows about sin. It teaches it in our schools. It puts it on your devices. What was unspeakable 20 years ago has been applauded today. But it goes deeper than this. This is not an acknowledgement of the sins of others Christians acknowledge their own sin. They take ownership of our own sin. And I have to ask this question because I've been asking myself this all week. Where has our heartbreak gone over our sinfulness? Where has our sorrowful regret gone? When I was an intern, uh, Dick Thompson, one of the elders at our church, came in and he was getting ready to talk to Jerry, and I was just having a conversation with him, and he was just saying things like, you know, I'm just so thankful that, you know, God's given me grace, and he's just patient with me because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty big mess up, and I just haven't been doing everything right. And here I am looking at Dick Thompson, who's one of the most godly people I know, and he's under the impression that he is so far from God. And then I'm sitting there going, well, I don't feel that way at all. And I noticed uh, a really important truth that day. Uh, imagine, uh, this is easier for me just to do it this way. Imagine that uh, you and I are on uh, opposite sides of a football field. We're that far away from one another. 
From that far away, we look a lot alike. If I wave with my right hand, you wave with your right hand, hey, we both have hands, right? And if I wave with my right foot, and you wave with your right foot, hey, we both have feet. We're a lot alike. And then we get to like the 75-yard line, I'm like, hey, I got clothes on. You got clothes on too, right? As you get closer, hey, you've got a beard. I've got a beard. You're a dude, hopefully, right? We, we're learning stuff about one another. Okay, now look, the further we are away, the more alike we look, but the closer we get, we start going, well, hold on a second. You're wearing different clothes than me. You're skinnier than me. Your shoes are nicer. My shoes are worn. You have blue eyes. I have brown eyes. The closer we get together, the more we realize we're different. Maybe the reason you think you don't have that much to confess, maybe the reason why you don't think you have that much to repent of is because when you think about you and Jesus, you think, you think you're really close. But people who think they look a lot like Jesus are actually pretty far from Jesus. The crazy thing is, if you're the person who thinks you're a long way off from Jesus, to the outside world you know what you look like? The closest thing to Jesus. Dick Thompson was going, I don't look at all like Jesus because he was looking at himself and God and he was going, man, there's just such a huge disconnect between us. There's so many differences. God has just been so gracious and so patient with me. He's like, oh, I'm just so far away from him. But I'm looking going, that dude's one of the closest dudes to Jesus that I have ever seen. Maybe the reason why we feel like we don't have that much to get rid of and that much to be sorrowful about is because we're looking at Jesus from miles and miles apart, which means we're not nearly as close as we ought to be. As Christians, we confess our sins, we own it, we acknowledge it, and God is gracious to forgive it. Third thing that Christians do is we recognize that Jesus is our Savior, but not just our Savior, he's also the Savior of the world. First John chapter two, verses one through two says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Christians recognize that the standing we have, that what we have, is all because of Jesus. We don't take credit for who we are. We take credit for knowing him, that Jesus is the one who made it possible. And this kind of goes into my sermon from last week. For those of you who missed it, make sure you, you check it out because this will make more sense if you know about last week's message. Look, Jesus is the savior of the whole world, which means that Jesus is trying to, has paid the sins for the people that you know and the people that live in your house and the people that live in your neighborhood, he is trying to draw them to him and the way you behave impacts how they believe. The fourth thing that Christians do is they keep his commands. First John chapter or two, verses three through six. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. You and I, we are supposed to live like Jesus lived. It's supposed to be evident to the people around us. If, uh, how many of you at all of our locations, you know somebody who's a runner? Yeah, raise your hands. Okay, you know who runners are. They're the people who are like, I'm just not myself unless I get my three miles in, right? Okay, cool, man. Uh, I just, you know, I get a runner's high. I just really feel like, okay, cool. They have short shorts and tights. They have shoes that, that nobody's heard of that you only get at like weird places. Runners. Just so you know, if I were to ask you guys to take a vote on whether or not you think I'm a runner, 
you'd all be right. Clayton doesn't run. That's right. Because they're going to catch me, okay? And when they catch me, I'm not going to have any of my strength left. Now, do you ever go up and ask a runner where's a good place to eat? Never. Why? But if you want to know where a good place to eat, question, you think this guy could help you? You think I know where the tasty places are? It takes work to keep this going. It takes a lot of intake, all right? Now listen, when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, it should be evident that, hey, you're a runner. Like it should come across to everybody around you, this dude's got something going on. They should walk in it, they should operate in it. You go, but I, I don't know what, how do I do that? Well, the Bible says, you read his word to understand what he wants you to do, and then you do the things he's called you to do with the help of the Holy Spirit. How can we say that we are with the Father if we never do the things the Father does? How can we call ourselves Jesus followers if we never follow in the steps of Jesus? Number five, he calls us to love others. First John chapter two, verses nine through 11. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. And there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. But they do not where they, know where they are or where they are going because darkness has blinded them the preeminent quality of christians is supposed to be the characteristic of love our love for god and our love for others is supposed to be evident to all and your level of love for others indicates your level of commitment to christ well that's tough because we have a tendency to love the world more than we love others john says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, your sexual desires, the lust of the eyes you desire to have and covet, and the pride of life, the feeling that you don't need God's help for anything comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. This is not a Jesus and proposition. There are not two sides to this coin. When he says love the world, he's not saying don't love the people of the world. We're called to love the people of the world. But sometimes our love for the things of the world keep us from reaching the people in the world. What's the thing that you're holding on to that's keeping you from reach the, reaching the people that God called you to? First John says this in chapter 3. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is where our love for the world interferes with our love for the people of the world. This is where our love for the things in the world interfere with our love for God. Something that I've been navigating is I get frustrated politically when a certain group of people won't do what I want them to do, even though I'm not doing it even in my own life. I can get frustrated with the handling of the refugee crisis, and I want certain people to spend a certain amount of money to make sure that they solve it, but a person who has material possessions and sees a person in need and has no pity on them. I'm being exposed. That politically, I just want other people to do what I don't want to do myself. He's saying, 
that hate that wells up inside of you? And I've had this happen multiple times this year when people say something about me that's not true or people treat me a certain way or they treat my family a certain way, all of a sudden, right in here, it just starts to build up and all of a sudden I, I find myself full of hate. And then I'm reading verses like this that say, you can love God or you can hate your brother and sister, but you cannot do both. Maybe our tone and our witness and our impact is being negated by our selfishness, by our comfort. Man, we wanna do great things for God as long as we don't have to give up our vacation. We wanna do great things for God and reach our neighborhood as long as we don't have to give up our night. We wanna help people who are poor as long as it's somebody else's money. And he keeps saying, John just keeps saying, if, if we love him, this is how we behave, and if we don't, this is how we behave. And I would like to think <laughs> that I'm here, and my family might go, I'm here, and right now you might go, he's here. Where are you? What's the cure for this? He tells us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. He says, continue in him. The word for continue is the word abide. John uses this word twice as much as every other author in the New Testament combined. It's almost as if every other word is the word abide. Now let me tell you what abide means. How many of you have ever been in a hot tub? At all of our locations, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a friend who has a hot tub, those are the best hot tubs, okay? And you, you sit in that hot tub and you stay there a while. You end up talking, you end up watching a game, whatever you do, you stay there. And then what happens? You get wrinkles. You can tell when someone's been in a hot tub for a really long time because they get wrinkles. They have abided. My boys will take a bath and be like, boys, get out. And they're like, dad, we haven't been in that long. Our fingers aren't wrinkly yet. What they're saying is, we haven't abided yet. What he's saying is, be so long in your time with Jesus that you get Jesus wrinkles, that you are not just spending a moment with him in the morning and a moment with him over your lunch, but that you are abiding in him. He's saying, I want you to abide in me, and you cannot abide one hour a week on a Thursday or a Sunday, uh, or you cannot abide in him a couple weekends a month. That's attending, that's not abiding. Abiding is where you Allow yourself to be fully engulfed in all that God is wanting to do and all that God is calling you to. When you wake up, you're cognizant of him and you're asking him and you're communicating with him and you're reading his word and when you're driving and when you're eating and when you're playing and when you're laughing, you are constantly asking yourself, God, what is it that you're calling me to do? What is it that you want me to do? You are abiding in him. And sometimes I think the reason why the younger generation is falling off from their relationship with the Lord at an absolutely alarming pace, and you as parents, you're worried about that, is because all they ever saw from parents is attendance, but not abiding. A saturation that should take place. And I know you look out the same window that I look at, and you see a world that's hurting just like I see a world that's hurting and you know there's a world that needs Jesus and I see that world too but I can tell you that world will never find Jesus until you and I walk in the light and until you and I lead with love and I'm hoping you'll join me on that we're moving to a time of decision
What up, YouTube family? Hope you guys enjoyed this week's message. I'm gonna encourage you guys to do four things today. One, would you hit that like button and let us know that the content that we're producing is being a benefit to you and to your family. Second thing I'm gonna encourage you to do is hit that subscribe button so that we, we can start to coalesce and go on this journey together. The third thing I'm gonna encourage you to do is hit that bell button. That bell's gonna turn on your notifications so every time we upload content, you'll be notified so you can join in with us as soon as possible. And then the last thing, is if you feel like you've been blessed to be a blessing and you don't give uh, to another church, we would love to give you an opportunity to be generous with us as we try to be generous towards God. You can go into the description below and you can click that link called for the Give app and it will walk you through everything you need to do to make that a reality. We appreciate you, we love you, and God bless you.